my shit! Huh? Where am I? Why is everything red? Why is everything on fire? Don't you know? You're in my lands. You're f***ing dead. No. No, 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 no. That's impossible. How did this happen? Seriously. Don't you remember what happened in the last episode? Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck? What the hell are they doing in an SD game? You shouldn't have done that, pal. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, that explains why my head is hurting so much. So, how do I escape from here? Are you mad? No one can escape from this place. You're in the land of the dead, goddammit. Tell me how to escape and I'll give you more screen time. You son of a bitch, I meant. The only way to escape from this shithole is by talking about the most requested topic according to your subscribers. Is that so? Well, that's very easy. Tell me, what do I have to do? A review? A top 5? Tell me, what is it? You gotta be fucking kidding me. Shin Megami Tensei 2 what can be said that hasn't been said yet? It's the sequel of the best Megami Tensei ever created. And due to being the sequel of an already perfect game, it couldn't keep up with the hype. Although that doesn't mean it's a bad video game. It's the opposite, in fact. Just like in the previous entry, it still has unforgettable characters, amazing soundtrack, incredible world design, and slightly improved gameplay. Unfortunately, Atlus stuff it wouldn't sell as much as SMT1 did. That's why they only released four versions of this game on different consoles: Super Famicom, PlayStation 1, Game Boy Advance, and mobile devices. These are gonna be the games that we will take a look at today. Sup guys, Carlos here. Today we'll take a look at every port Shin Megami Tensei 2 has released over the past years to find out which one is the superior and easiest one to pick up and play. To make the video different from my honest verdict series, I'm going to focus on gameplay, soundtrack, and the other known aspects that make a video game great, as well as other minor details such as the box art, cartridge slash disc, and even our clue team manual to make the video at least 30 seconds longer. Every time I talk about a specific component and one version surpasses the others, a water will appear representing the score. At the end of this video, the oi, version oi, with the oi, most oi, walters oi, oi. will be the winner. Sadly, because I'm using a PC that tends to crash so fucking often, recording the gameplay from all my playthroughs was impossible. That's why I had to contact other content creators to help me out with their videos. Big shoutouts to Buffmeister, Nekotaka, Fraxune Sao no Megaten Shaneru, Himaru, and Sayoneus for letting me use their gameplays in this video. You have no idea how much they have helped me by sharing their videos to use them today. Thank you so much guys. Don't forget to check out their channels once you finish watching this video. Before I start with this cyberpunking journey, only 4% of you guys have subscribed to this channel. Dude, that's so fucking depressing. Shut up. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to my channel, leave a like, and let me know what you think in the comments down below. Seeing constant support for any of you is my motivation higher than ever. Now it's time to answer the question that all of us have been wondering. Which version of Shin Megami Tensei 2 is better? Let's find it out together. What is the best way to know more about the ports of today's video? By talking about each one of them, of course, starting from the first version ever created, the Super Famicom, to the last one, the iOS slash Android. Released on March 18, 1994, almost two months after the SMT1 Sega CD port, Shin Megami Tensei 2 arrives on the Japanese market, being a great sequel to an already excellent game. I would like to go into details about what makes this game good. Yet, that isn't the point of this video. This version in particular is by far the most played and known for being the only one that, to this day, has been translated into English. 
I also was one of those people that pick up this version immediately after finishing SMT1 and it still holds up very well throughout these 29 years. This version can be played on the Super Famicom, Nintendo Wii, Wii U and Nintendo Switch. But Atlus wasn't satisfied enough. They wanted to release more ports while they were planning what was gonna be the future of Shin Megami Tensei. That's why on March 20, 2002, Atlus released Shin Megami Tensei 2 for the PlayStation 1. Just how they did with SMT1, as we all know, SMT2 for the PS1 has the same improvements as the first game included. Enhanced graphics, more movement options, easy difficulty, a demon analyzer, and of course, increased walking speed. What not many people know about this port is there are two versions of it. The first one being the one that was released on launch day. According to many Japanese players, this version was very buggy. Therefore, Atlus retired the glitch game from the stores and changed them for an updated version with those glitches already patched. If you ask me what were those glitches, I can't give you evidence of what is it exactly, but I have a feeling that it's related to the infamous Tarukaya glitch from the original SMT2. In case you don't know about this motherfucking glitch, if Aleph or Hiroko's physical power were increased by using Tarukaya too much, the game won't be able to keep up with high values, resulting in an abrupt attack value reset. If you didn't understand a shit of what I said, don't worry, I know how that feels. I had a stroke while I was saying all that crap. Long story short, if you spam Tarukaya too much, there is a chance that Aleph and Hiroko will start dealing from 2000 damage per hit to 21 damage per hit. This glitch can be seen more often during the last act of the game, where Aleph's physical strength is already at its maximum. But after I beat this specific port, I can say for sure that I didn't experience this glitch, not a single occasion. Probably because I was playing the patch version that I mentioned moments ago. However, do not think I'm lying about this glitch. I can 100% confirm that exists in the original game because I suffered these effects on the worst possible moments. This particular port can be found in the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 3, PSP, and PS Vita. Without leaving the opportunity to gain more money, on September 26, 2003, Atlus released the third Shin Megami Tensei 2 version. This time, however, for a different video game market, the portable system, SMT2 for the Game Boy Advance. This time, Atlus did one of their special Atlus moments during the development of this port. Try to guess what is the difference between the GBA port of the first game and the GBA port of the second game. I won't even give you time to answer it, there are zero differences between each other. The graphics and the soundtrack was downgraded for running in a less powerful console, they added a demo library, and the reason why you wanna play this port in the first place, the visionary items, collectibles that you get after accomplishing certain stacks during your playthrough. If you want to play SMT2 wherever you want, this port is the perfect choice to satisfy your SMT need. This version can be found in the GBA, and if you watch my SMT1 comparison video, you know what is the other device that can emulate this port. Jumping almost 9 years into the future, on June 12, 2012, Shin Megami Tensei 2 will receive a mobile port exclusively for Japanese iOS, and on December 20, 2012, will receive another port, but for Japanese Android instead. Adlus had the opportunity on their hands to launch this game overseas. Unfortunately, back in those years, the Persona Fever was starting to emerge to give a crap about the old SMT games. So, what makes this version special compared to the others? Imagine grabbing the GBA version of any video game, replacing the soundtrack with a more beloved arranged version of it, and adding an uncomfortable touchy controller layout with no options to play with an external controller. That's the mobile version of SMT2, a mix between two ports with the addition of touch controllers. As you might realize, while I present you every version available, unlike SMT1 with its iOS port, none of these versions were released overseas. As a result, the only way to play SMT2 in other countries outside of Japan is by downloading a copy from the internet, which is very sad. 
Why Atlus has done such poorly work making the game accessible 20 years after its release. God fucking damn it! Well, it's time to break some hearts and destroy expectations. To find out which one will be the winner, I'll use the water points this system. The port which has the most waters at the end of the video will win. Now, let us imagine we are a Japanese children, teenagers or adults back in the 90s, and we want to acquire a video game without knowing anything about it. What do you think will be the main selling point? That's right, the box art. The iOS was a digital release, so even mentioning it is a waste of time. The GBA box art is nice. I like how this design resembles the interior of a cathedral, which makes more sense once you realize SMT2 is a low-focused Megami Tensei game. Choosing between the Super Famicom and PlayStation 1's box art was one of the toughest choices I made during the production of this video. For one side we have the Super Famicom version with the four archangels as well as Aleph and all the members from the center. On the other side we have the PlayStation 1 port with angels falling out from the sky. I love both designs and I love to give one water to both of them, but I have a slight problem with the Super Famicom box art. Where's Hiroko? I know she isn't with the others because of a particular spoiler that I won't go into details about, but still, she was a member of the center and she deserved to be in the box art. The water goes to the PlayStation 1 port. What is the most magical feeling once you purchase a physical copy of any video game? Opening the box and seeing how the disc or cartridge is designed. The iOS cartridge design is so goddamn revolutionary that it's invisible. That's the type of shit only seen in Apple. The luxury of spending over $1,000 on a cell phone. The GBA cartridge is just a copy paste from the box art design. What an Atlus moment, what the fuck. If you watch the SMT1 comparison video, you might think that I will give the water to the PlayStation 1 port for featuring characters from the story on the disc design. It's a shame, you are far from my point of view. Wish you were right though. Unlike the SMT1 PlayStation 1 disc, SMT2 only features Aleph, Hiroko and Beth, saying Gimel and Dalet are nowhere to be seen. Also, the yellow color doesn't look as good as the sky blue one from the first game. That breaks up with the only option remaining, the Super Famicom one. What makes it superior? The SMT2 logo does cover 80% of the label, but the rest of it has an exclusive look at Tokyo Millennium, which can't be seen anywhere else outside the cartridge. In case I wasn't obvious enough, I have a guilty pleasure for Tokyo Millennium's design and every artwork Oi. which features it. The manual, that piece of paper that we love to read on the way to our houses. Its purpose was to inform us about the game mechanics, a summary of the story, and so more. SMT2 had three different physical launches. As we all know, all of them were Japan exclusive, meaning every single manual from this video is in Japanese. Of course, I have zero knowledge of that language like the failure I am. Because of that, I will analyze them the same as a kid will do, by only checking the pictures in them. Let's start with the GBA manual. It has by far the most impressive artwork for the rest. Unfortunately, if you watch my rarest and most expensive Mega 10 games, you might remember that this port is expensive as fuck. I searched for like an hour for a scanned version of the internet without any result, so I can't give a decent analyze to consider giving it a Walter. The Super Famicom has everything that I love about a menu, an exclusive Tokyo Millennium artwork, leaving us with the PlayStation 1 manual and its fantastic front page. Sit down and take a look at this monstrosity and tell me you don't like it. In my opinion, Oi. it's the most memorable thing on the PS1 port. The SMT2 intro is by far my favorite one from the series, haven't left my head since the first time I listened to it. It's sad to know that all the versions of this game had the same intro with zero alteration aside from the graphics and music. As to anyone's surprise, the GBA version has the worst intro for having the least appealing graphics and annoying background music that will destroy your eardrums. Wish I was joking about this. The Super Famicom intro is excellent, I have no problem with it. However, just watch the PS1 intro. The colors, Tokyo Millennium being built, and the music, oh shit I love it! 
the Walter Goes to the PS1 intro. These six minutes have been a complete waste of time considering many of you are watching this video because of this specific aspect, the gameplay. Let's start with the version that started it all and the one that the majority of us have played to experience this game for the first time, the Super Famicom. To be honest with you, this version still holds up very well by today's standards. Over the past weeks while working on this video, I read a lot of comments saying SMT2 is also a tough game to play nowadays. And I have to say, those people can be more wrong. SMT2, or like the first one, is a more balanced entry mechanically and gameplay wise. The game runs and plays faster, booting up the ARM computer isn't a tedious tax anymore by pressing R a functional map will show on the screen, a skill inheritance was added which is frustrating to make it work as someone wants, new spells to make your journey easier and so much more. Unlike the Super Famicom version of its predecessors, this one still holds up surprisingly well. If you forget about the annoying attack power glitch that I talked about moments ago. The PlayStation 1 port is definitely something I was very hyped to give it a try once I started working on this video. And after one low playthrough, I gotta say, it's the same as the SMT1 PS1 port. Don't get me wrong, that's far from being a bad thing, but it has all the upgrades from that port with the inclusion of the new addition the second game has. By pressing R1 or R1, you can do side steps. Booting up the art computer and going through the menus is a bit faster, an easier difficulty, and more. It doesn't matter how you look at it, this port was designed to have improved gameplay over the original. It was the main purpose of why this game was made in the first place. Although there is something I missed completely the last time I compared video games and its respective gameplay, a mistake that I'll fix on 2 minutes. The GBA version is a downgraded version of the PS1 port. Even I'll go as far to say it's a worse port compared to its counterpart from its predecessor for having a soundtrack that is so bad that there is no reason to exist. It still has the visionary items, but would you really waste your time playing a downgraded version from an excellent port just to watch some cutscenes that are easy to find and watch on YouTube? The cell phone port is the fucking GBA port with the PS1 soundtrack. Its controls are awful and sometimes don't even respond properly. Speaking of which, there are multiple factors to make any video game enjoyable, and one of them is how good and responsive are its controls. I already talked about how it feels to use them during the gameplay, so I will save a brief description of them to continue with the video. The Super Famicom controller is good, comfy, and has everything you need already assigned on the bottoms. The PlayStation 1 has every positive thing I've said for the Super Famicom 1, but with the option to change the bottoms mapping however you like. The GBA 1 is okay, I mean, it works for how limited the bottoms are. And the mobile device sport is simply bad, man. It's funny how the first two versions are the ones that had the best controllers. Therefore, the PS1 port receives boy, two waters for having the best gameplay and a customizable controller. And the Super Famicom receives boy. one water for having a controller that doesn't need any modification for how good it is. Remember when I said I'll fix a mistake I made in the last video? Well, it's time to add a point that I completely forgot in the SMT1 video. You didn't expect this one, did you? While I was playing the three remaining versions, I noticed something that passed through me without even thinking it was a point that I must consider. Do the original game and its ports have loading times? The answer is yes, they have, but are so fast that are barely noticeable except for the PlayStation 1 port. Every time you enter or leave an area, initiate combat against a common enemy, or fuse a demon, the game suffers from loading times that are everything but fast. Just watch if you don't believe me. Oh, ah, 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 すごいねこれ。こんなん気づかないやん。こんなんも教えてもらえないとわかんないじゃん。I do understand why this game has this problem, but it's simply too noticeable to ignore it. One Walter for the Super Famicom, Game Boy Advance, and for the first time in this subseries, one for the iOS slash Android version. SMT2 and its ports remain the story from the original game. 
The only port that could be treated differently is the GBA version for having the well-known visionary items. Collectibles that you obtain during your journey after doing specific tasks, such as defeating a boss, completing a side quest, or even joining one of the three alignments available. Due to the GBA and every fucking version of this game being a Japanese exclusive launch, all the visionary items are in Japanese, and only a user named Mermot has started working on its translation by using Europe's subtitles tool. Unfortunately, half of the video hasn't been translated yet, but believe it or not, not everything is bad. Years ago, someone translated every visionary item from this game. You can check out the link I left in the description to read them if you want. By the way, if you want me to translate them by using that script, please let me know. Anyways, back to the video. Compared to SMT1's visionary items, these are way more interesting and intriguing. Without going into spoilers, even though this game was released 29 years ago, some of them make you feel empathy for characters such as Megara, Saiyan, and even Dalek. But those won't be as good as the ones involving Kazuya, the first champion of Valhalla. The first one is a conversation between Maidam and Alfred, who served him to make Valhalla a safe place for anyone who needs it. Still worried about not being able to keep Valhalla as safe after Kazuya's death. And the one that I also love is when Maidam reunites with Cerberus. And you know who was the original master of that Cerberus. Who tells Maidam how lost his will to continue living after not being able to save his owner. The first time I read this, you have no idea how sad I felt. The GBA version expanded the story Boy. to other levels that I thought it was impossible. Shin Megami Tensei 2 may share the same engine as the first game, yet it looks surprisingly superior for some reason, probably because of how different the atmosphere is, a very futuristic and charming atmosphere. Its graphics were groundbreaking considering consoles with much higher power will be released in that same year but still look and looks nice up to now. The PlayStation 1 refined the cyberpunk team by improving the background, which were a huge part to resemble the plot SMT2 was involved in. The GBA port, as we all of us expect, has the same graphics as the PS1 port, but with a noticeable downgrade. We are talking about the GBA after all. That change was necessary to make this thing playable in a handheld console. What I'm gonna say now might be contradictory. But that's how I felt when I played this game. The Super Famicom version has better graphics than the PS1 port. It's hard to explain why I have this opinion because it's something that you have to experience on your own. When I replayed the original SMT2, I appreciated the background more than I thought. Once I stopped replaying it and go for its upgrade, I don't know. The backgrounds looked better but felt soulless at the same time. I know, it doesn't make sense at all. Just do yourself a favor and play both versions to see where I'm getting at. Oh yeah, the Walter goes to the Oi. Super Famicom version. In the Megaten community, this game and its prequels are known for being some of the easiest games from the series. And I wonder, what did those people play in the first place? SMT1 is easy if we don't count the Mega CD port. But SMT2's last two bosses were so goddamn difficult for barely being able to hit them. Anyways, my personal experience isn't the reason why you are watching this. The PS1 port featured the normal and expert difficulty, being this last one the original difficulty from this game with a fixed random encounter rate. In other words, normal was in fact an easy difficulty disguised. And if you played the original SMT2, you know this is the most difficult port from the bunch for having the classic encounter rate from the older Mega Ten games. Its encounter rate isn't as bullshit as the one seen in SMT1 and two of these ports, but still can cause you nightmares if you are not prepared for the worst. I'll give two waters for this aspect. Oi. One to the PS1 port for featuring a chicken difficulty, Oi. and one for the Super Famicom for having a difficulty that still makes people cry since its launch. Even though this game lacks a Mega CD and a PC Engine port, that doesn't mean there are versions, or rather, versions, that add exclusive content to the game. You know which one I'm referring to, the GBA port. We have the visionary items that I already explained, but it also features some demons that were exclusively for the SMT1's Mega CD port. Demons well known such as Apsaras, Kushinara, Amon, and Jorlongor were exclusive for the Mega CD port and later on added to this port. 
We are not done yet with this feature, however. To get those demons and the rest of them, you have to trade a new currency called Memory Ships with an NPC. This new currency can be obtained during your journey, and if you wanna play this game, I highly recommend you to do so. Most of the tradable demons are busted as fuck. The visionary items were an amazing feature, no one can deny that. The exclusive demons and the way to obtain them might look unnecessary, but hey, it's a fun feature that increases the replayability for a version that needs any bonus to keep up with the others. The GBA deserves this Walter. SMT2 has a great soundtrack. It's not as good as the first game, but its soundtrack is still memorable and enjoyable. Like the case with its prequel, the Super Famicom soundtrack has aged surprisingly well. It's such a classic that it doesn't matter how many times it gets rearranged. It still sounds incredible. Unless it's the GBA version. The GBA soundtrack fucking killed 90% of this game's soundtrack. Do yourself a favor and listen to it by yourself. The PlayStation 1 sounds incredible. The work the composer did is admirable. And they made the whole soundtrack close to perfection. But being close to perfection doesn't mean you are the best. I'll still say this port has an amazing soundtrack as long as you are selected with which one you want to listen to. Unlike the original game where every single track has aged like fine wine. That's the best 60 Vix Eras magic example I can think of. I would like to show you a proper comparison between these two. But Atlus is very picky with his soundtrack. And I want this video to be monetized. I need to eat, goddammit. Anyways, the Walter goes to the Super Famicom. Explaining this port is gonna be the shortest and easiest one from this video for two reasons. I don't wanna extend this video more and there is only one right answer here, which is the Super Famicom. Until this day, it's the only version that has been translated into English. The PS1, GBA and iOS haven't received an English patch and it seems there isn't one coming soon for any of those versions. The Super Famicom Boy. gets the Walter. And has a small side note, the Super Famicom is the cheapest one to get, while the other two, well, good fucking luck getting one cheaper than this. After covering most of the aspects seen in this video game to find out which one is the best version, here's the final result of today's video. A very tight competence, don't you think? Well, it's finally time to announce the winner of this comparison video. The best, superb and ultimate version of this game is don't you dare don't fucking say it not of them fucking damn it what you really expect another answer to this day Adlu has ignored both smt1 and 2's existence just as they always did with persona 1 and 2 29 years after its launch he hasn't received the definitive version that includes the what makes the Super Famicom and PlayStation 1 so special and the bonus that the GBA version has to offer. Still, if I had to recommend you one version to get into SMT2, it will be the winner of today's video. The Super Famicom version, for being the best version and the only one everyone can pick up and play without issues. Despite this, if you know Japanese, I recommend you to play the PlayStation 1 port instead. Make use of your knowledge properly. Anyways, congratulations! SMT2 is awesome. The fact that any of these ports weren't enough to surpass the original game still makes it a solid entry in the Mega Ten series. And this year might be the perfect opportunity to experience this game. We are in the 30th anniversary. Tell me something else that they could announce instead of that game. <laughs> Satan, could you please continue with the video? I had to do something. Hey, where the fuck are you going? I never said I will. Oh well, he's gonna come back. He's in fucking hell after- It seems now I have full control of the channel. Time to make some changes. I never thought I would make this video only 5 months later than the first comparison video. But what surprised me the most is the fact that the SMT1 video is by far the video with the most consistent views per day. If we don't count the No More Heroes Out of Context videos. Now, what's next? 
I said I would work on the Kyuyaku Megami Tensei 2 video for the last 3 or 4 videos, but I'm planning to postpone that video one last time to make the first spin off Megami Tensei protagonist video. You know one, the which one suffered the most. Which I have an idea of how well things will go. So, in theory, it shouldn't take me that long to finish, I hope. As always, thank you so much for watching this video until the end. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.